Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Boxing Podcast. We are sponsored by 32 Red. I'm your host, Dev Sarni, and with me is a man who, well, let me put it this way. If he were to box American boxing commentator Jim Gray seven times, he would be seven and oh. It is, of course, Mr. Steve Lillis. <laughs> what an intro, Dev. What an intro. You know what? I think me and Jim would be pretty close, you know. I reckon, I reckon it could be a 3-3-1 three, three, in seven and people <laughs> asking for the eighth. Well, that, that is, of course, a reference back to Adrian Broner's post-fight interview after comfortably losing to Manny Pacquiao last weekend. So Jim Gray, the interviewer, really put it on him and it culminated somewhat shockingly in Adrian Broner claiming that while he may be 3-3-1 three, three, and one in his last seven fights, if those bouts were replaced with consecutive fights against Jim Gray, he would be 7-0. and oh. What do you reckon to that, Steve? Is that, is, that, is that true? Does he have a point? Should he be saying that? He shouldn't be saying that. Look, he's quite, you know, uh, you know what? He's a crass person. I've witnessed him since when he first fought um, Matthew Hatton in Anaheim. And he, he wasn't a nice person to be around that week. And that was before he became a superstar. It, no, no, nothing surprises me with him. He's 3-3-1 in his last seven fights. And, you know, most of boxing would love it if he was 0-7 and seven in his last seven fights. Well, what does he do now, Steve? He either continues being a mouthy gatekeeper for welterweights you know who you, you beat on you who good welterweights beat or if he wants to get serious which i think there's a 10 percent chance of this he should go back to lightweight where he was a good fighter you dreaming steve he's not getting down to lightweight uh, he's Have you not, seen he's him not going fights? to yeah he's not going to that is the only thing he, he loses 12 pound whatever and gets back to life. If he wants to have any chance of rescuing his career, the way he carries on between fights, he's going to end up in jail. Um, otherwise, he's just going to be there as a keep busy fight for good, solid welterweights. And what about Manny Pacquiao? He's he's proving he is a good, solid welterweight right now, even at the age of forty. What does he do now? You know what? I, 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 you, I think we've got to, you know, cut him some, you know, real slack since, you know, you think since the Mayweather loss, that was a stinker fight. Since then, he beat Tim Bradley, Jesse Vargas, lost a controversial one to Jeff Horn in Australia, ripped the heart out of Lucas Matisse and has beaten Broner. Now, in recent times, that is as good a run in, in recent years as any world away has been on. So he's got to get a big fight. I think, obviously, the one he's angling for is the Mayweather return, mm. um, even though it's not a fight that particularly fills me with enthusiasm. The first one was a stinker. They're both, you know, four years older. Um, it's a fight that should have happened 10 years ago. Since then, Mayweather has just fought Andre Berto, Conor McGregor, and the little <laughs> j- j- the Japanese flyweight <laughs> kickboxer. So it doesn't do anything for me, but it's still the richest fight out there for him. And although the fight isn't a good fight, Pacquiao might even start favourite this time or be fancy by a lot more people, at least I'd say. Yeah, it, it did feel like on the on the broadcast as well, because we, we got the, the American feed from Showtime, they were really trying to set that up. They were interviewing Mayweather ringside saying, are you going to fight him? He, he was kind of non-committal. And then you see in the, in the days following that, there was like a, a meeting at a basketball game, just like before, yeah. and, and a fist bump with Pacquiao and Mayweather passing each other. I don't know. I don't want it, Steve. I don't, I don't want that work. I, I, I don't want it. But you know what? Boxing's a business. It generates money. It's still the richest fight out there for Pacquiao. Look, he you know, earned 100 million last time, mm. maybe with a 300 million, whatever the figures. You know, I'm not, I think that's what the figures were, something crazy like that. It's the richest fight out there for them. You can see why Showtime are wetting their pants over it. Pay per view in America isn't doing the business that, that it was, Dev. So, this fight, does it make sense to me and you? No. Does it make sense to Showtime pay per view? Yes, because it does great business for them again. Yeah, no doubt it will be a big fight. Well well said, Steve Lillis. This week, we are bringing that fire to your ears. We've got an exclusive and a very time-sensitive interview with IBF World Featherweight Champion Josh Warrington, who looks back on 2018 and talks us through his options for 2019. We hear from 15-0 heavyweight sensation Nathan Gorman. We hear from the brother of Tyson Fury, Tommy Fury, who's looking to make his own name in boxing. And also on the show is a man who fought Vasil Lomachenko for £400. Yes, that's right. It's GB amateur star and 10-0 pro Sam Maxwell. So, yeah, the show's just a little bit packed. Uh, I'm just a little bit hyped. 
and I've probably talked for just a little bit too long in this segment. Enjoy the next hour or so. It's the Boxing Podcast. Josh Warrington had the dream 2018. He got to fight at the ground of his football team, Leeds United. He got his favourite band to play him out to the ring. He got his favourite footballer to walk him out to the ring. He got to fight a rival in Lee Selby, who'd been slagging him off for years, and he got to do it for a world title. You think that's enough? Absolutely not. He then went on to a monster fight against Carl Frampton. A lot of people were tipping him to lose that, but he won. And all the while, he had a film come out about his life. He had twins. Well, not him. I mean, that, that would be quite something. But, you know, as a family, they had twins. He's moved into a new gaff. Here's Steve Lillis with IBF World Featherweight Champion, Josh Warrington. Josh, before we look ahead to what could be another fantastic year for you, 2018, yep. it was the stuff dreams were made of, wasn't it? Not just in the ring, but outside the ring. Yeah, it wasn't so bad, mate. Um, you know, if, in terms of fairy tales, you couldn't really have written a better year. You know, 2018 were very special and right up there in, in the memory bank. Um, you know, there were so many moments and events what happened. Um, you know, two massive fights, stadium and a, and a big box office one. Um, Birth of my twins. Um, I moved out, so I had a film come out. So it was a very busy old year. But, um, you know, it's many people have said it's going to be hard to top that, but it just makes me motivated to uh, to, tr to try so. I mean, just what you know, just look back at that last fight, the Frampton fight. You know, it was a classic fight. But yeah. just picking one part of the fight, what was it like to be involved in a fight for those first six minutes of that intensity and brutality? Oh, I loved it, Steve. Absolutely loved it. I mean, uh, you know, many people aren't saying that, that side to me where I like to... A standing trader. Obviously, I'm known as, you know, go forward pressure fighter, but standing and trading, you know, not, not many people have seen me have seen me do that, but, you know, a lot of times throughout camps, I do, I do that. I'll, I could, I'd do it week in, week out if, uh, if my old fellow allowed me to, you know, <laughs> you know, the inspiring. It. I, love, I love nothing more than the title, but, um, yeah, to, to be doing it on the big stage in, in front of a, a massive crowd in Manchester against, you know, one of the greats of like Carl Frampton, it's where uh, yeah, we were good, mate. Very enjoyable. And what what have you been up to since the fight? Um, well, I think the first week after the fight, more or less, went in, into a haze be, just because of like the Christmas period. We're instantly amongst us, so you know, by the time I got home and uh, from Manchester and uh, settled down. It, you know, they were well into Christmas period, so we had like Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then Boxing Day. Before you know it, a week had gone, and then we were into New Year's period. So, they were like seven to ten days, more or less, seemed to just disappear, and I don't know where they went. Um, and then after that, we're catching up with uh, with different bits of media and catching up on other stuff away from boxing. And, um, I've started, I've got a bit of a property portfolio now. And with things with I can't really do whilst I'm in camp, or I, I tend not to do when I'm in camp. I uh, put it to one side and, and try to catch up with it uh, when I've got a bit of time. So, and boxing wise, you know, is it still waiting to see how things pan out next, whether it's Galahad or whether you go to Valdez? Because the purse bids are in a couple of days or a day or so. Yeah, well, uh, I'm just um, leaving all that with, with, with Stephen and Frank. Um, you know, they, they, they do all T's and C's and then. Know, come just like put it in a basic a basic context for me and, and then I just go from there really but um, you know my, you know what I want to do Steve I want to I want to go and unify this year um, if I have to put a delay on that by fighting Galad then so be it um, or if it, if it makes sense to you know to go down the Valdez road then, then I'll do whatever's best for, for getting to that um, destination so when, when do you think there'll be a decision? Um, well Anytime soon, to be, fair, to be fair to you. I know that we're, I had actually went to go see Frank himself, um, well, along with Steve last week, and uh, I think we'll be, I mean, they've been speaking amongst themselves, so I think anytime soon now. After last year, you know, upsetting Selby when the odds were stacked against you, beating one yeah. of the most popular people in boxing and one a, a, a global name, Carl Frampton. If you suddenly had to fight Kid Galahad, and there's no disrespect to him at all, because, you know, he's a decent fighter, I'm not. You know, knocking him in, in when I ask this question, 
Is it tougher to get up now at this stage of the, your career for this than it would be an Oscar Valdez unification when you've got maybe 10,000 fans in, in Las Vegas with you? Um, yes and no. Yeah, because the circle lights here. We've got like Lee Selby, Carl Frampton, Kid Gallard. You know, that's no disrespect. Well, well, it is a bit of a disrespect just because of the way that he's gone about the, you know, like getting into the fight and whatnot. But when you're fighting two fighters there from world champions and, you know, massive actions behind him, you do think dropping down because you want to keep on going, climbing climbing the ladder, if that makes sense. You know, when yeah. you're going from Lee Selby when you're underdog, Frampton, you're underdog. You know, someone like Valdez, it'd be like, a, well, I don't know if I'd be an underdog now going into yeah. to a Valdez fight, but it'd be, it'd be like, oh, he's close, but that's the kind of fight what get me back up, you know what I mean, will give me that little bit of fear, and it excites me, and when I get against the gym, I know I've got to give it 100% because I'm going in with uh, a solid fight like that. With that being said, if he won um, Galad next, end of the day, I'm a champion, and I don't want to give that belt to nobody, and... Uh, Obviously, now I understand that I would have someone there trying to take that belt away from me. So I'd still train equally hard to to make sure I'm in the best physical shape and uh, you know bring an A class performance. Have you, have you thought of going to Texas next week to see Valdez against Carmine Tomasone? Um, no, no, I'd probably just watch on uh, probably just watch on the TV. Um, the missus don't like me going so far away since uh, you know I, I seem to be just away from from camp. Even though I'm at home, I'm not I'm not really there. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'll probably just watch out at home and uh, and then and then um, catch up from there. Do you expect Valdez to come through that easily, despite you know the broken jaw and being out a year? Yeah, yeah, you expect so, but it's 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 the always that old uh, cliche that one punch can change a fight, and you never know what can happen. And like I say, coming from a, a broken jaw, you don't know how tender that is, and how, how, how well that's healed. I mean, no doubt he'll have been sparring and taking punches on it and whatnot, but when you put them little eight ounce gloves on and you uh, take them red cards off, it's a different kettle of fish. So um, I expect him to to come through, can I mean, You know, he's he's, he's another level to win, but. Um, you can never know what's going to happen in boxing. And where do you think you are in your career now? Are you at a period where you're you're at the 18 months of your career where it's going to take something pretty special to stop you? You know, like all fighters have that period in their careers where they are the man. That is as good as they're going to get in that period. Yeah, I, I, I think so, Steve. I think it's been, it's been like, it's, it's come at the right time. For me, it's, it's been like a, a long time coming, but I understand the process. I, I seem to be building up to this stage for a long time. Obviously, coming up uh, for the small holes, and then I had a little bit of, um, you know, with Lee Torino over a few years, fighting the, the names, what were just probably fringe world level, building up my experience. And now, I, I think I've really, I really burst onto the scene over the last 12 months. And like I say, I've... Uh, his timing, momentum, and I feel like he's in my peak years, you know, in that last fight with Carl, I mean, there was times when we were having sort of toes, but I felt indestructible, I felt like I couldn't be hurt, you know, and uh, and for 36 minutes, like I say, it's going to take something very special to stop me with uh, the way I'm going. How long do you think you can stay at this peak for? Is it, you know, because it's not a thing a boxer can stay at forever, that no, intensity no, no. where you feel indestructible. It's obviously the 18 month window now. Is it these next yeah. 18 months where before you, you know, don't become in 18 months, you don't just fade overnight, but you might think, I wasn't doing that 18 months ago? Yeah, it's, it's this period where, you know, you're, you're, you're peaky, Canada. You want to be in the big fights. And, and that's, you know, why. He's swaying me towards, like, um, you know, Valdez. That's why I'm really interested in a, in a fight like that. I, if, I, if I had a moment where I'd, I'd want to fight Santa Cruz, you know, but um, I'm aiming that he did not want the fight, so which I'm a bit disappointed about. You know, I'm ranked number two in the Ring Magazine rankings, and he's ranked number one. And, you know, if you're ranked number one, you get one of them uh, shiny Ring Magazine belts, <laughs> and uh, they're all they lovely on me to TV, you know. So, um, you know, you want to fight, fight the best and while you're watching Greek, that's when you you feel like you can take on the world, and um, it's it's lovely. It's a lovely feeling to be in, but at the same time, you know you you do realise that it's not going to last forever. And uh, I want to be part of the big fa- big fights now, get them big payday's, and uh, and when when it does start to dip, then I'll get me caught and and and, and walk out the door. But uh, until then, you know, let bring them big fights on.
Is it a case of maybe having to go and beat a Valdez in America and shout for Santa Cruz out there? You know, I know you're not one to go and shout, but you can sell yourself and sell a fight well, you know, that you might have to shout for Santa Cruz and demand it, make, you know, almost make fight fans demand it. Yeah, I, th I think so, Steve. I think uh, you might be right there. You know, I think over the last um, 12 months, people have, like, well, after Selby fight, people have said, oh, Josh Warren, and, oh, did he just get a lucky win? But then, well, bouncing off of Carl Frampton as well, then they really had to take note. I've noticed my name got a few, uh, mentioned in a few interviews, different fighters over there. Santa Cruz had mentioned it. Uh, Shakur Stevenson had mentioned it. So people are, are, are talking about my name, but you know, I went over there, pulled off a big performance, then they would have to really, you know, take a note and listen to what I'm saying. And like you say, you know, being a, a, another world champion like uh, Oscar Valdez and then, you know, shouting out whoever's name, it, it would it would drop demand. Imagine 12, 18 months, you're still a child, 18 months, we say, you're still a champion and Shackle Stevenson is getting the, the credit, he's get you know, he keeps getting the credit. That's the sort of life-changing payday, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think all these um, these fights are, you know, the um, you know, Oscar's a, a big name. I think Santa Cruz is probably the biggest in the division at, at that moment in time. And like I say, with him being number one, that's what you want to test yourself. You want to test yourself against the best. Gary Russell has the potential to be one of the biggest names, but his inactivity does him no favours for his profile or for his fighting, to be honest with you. But he's got a lovely belt. That, that green and gold one's a lovely belt to add to collection. Um, but yeah, I think... From now on till you know, to a couple of years down the line, I don't want to be just involved in the big names, the big world title fights. Never mind like the the easy homecomings and the and the steady defenses to to give you know a, you know just to build the balance in that way. I want to I want the big ones, the big fights, the the big names, and and, and constantly fighting those who are in the the top five, the top three. They're the fights that really get me excited. And whilst I am in the condition that I'm at, that's why uh, that's why I want to fight. But yeah, me and my pals actually joked about it not long, not long ago. They said, you know, we get to a stage where you know win a few more belts, um, got a few more paydays under, you know, the big paydays under under our belt, tick another box off where we we've boxed in the states, and then dash in with something like that. She cost Stevenson when he's reaching his peak. Go on my back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? You know what? He, he's he's only he, they're talking about him, but he's still got a long way to go to get to the yeah, top, was not he? Of course, he's I've seen his last fight and uh, it was shouting my name after that, but he's a, he's a far way off. Um, you know, I think he's all right doing people who were just up there to be in front of you, but um, like I say, I might pick him. He's, 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 he's talented, but I haven't picked him in a career at this moment in time, and uh, I just don't think he'd get away with doing stuff like what he did to his last opponent with me. And just one final question from talking to you now and talking to you over the last 12 months, Josh, I, I do get the impression. When you leave boxing, you're one fighter who will be leaving on his own terms. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know what, Steve? I used to say to I used to say to Mrs. You know, I retire when I retire. Uh, I'll retire when I feel like it. I used to say to her, you know, I might go right up to the top of top of a tree and then come back down and win British title again, and then the college. I don't know. Well, retire when I retire. That's what I used to say to her. I used to, didn't have an age in mind, but now. Um, you know, 2018 has changed that with, with uh, you know, becoming a dad, and uh, you know, it's an hard, it's an hard sport. It's boxing as much as I love it. Now, as much as I realise it'd be hard to walk away and whatnot, you still got to have that end goal in mind. And uh, when it starts taking so much away from you, then you know that's when you've got to know when to to, to get your goal and like say uh, leave leave it. Um, you can always be involved in in other ways, but there's there's times when you know, you you will have had your time in the ring, and it's time to you not know, be the other side of the ropes. And I realise that, Steve. So um, yeah, when, I get, when, it, when the time's right, then I'll I'll, uh, then I'll walk away. But at this moment in time, I'm, I'm absolutely loving the sport, and I'm loving uh, I'm loving all these big occasions and these big fights. Well, good chat there, Steve. Thanks for getting us that exclusive. Warrington in good form as ever. He's always in good form. And you know what? Why shouldn't he be in good form? It's not even been a year. I think it's in, oh, February 14, Valentine's Day, when he's, his partner gave birth to twins. So the last 11 and a half months, what a whirlwind. <laughs> Pregnant. Well, his wife just had the twins just before the Selby fight, and he was still living at home. Then before the Frampton fight, he was arranging his move into his new house. Madness. And he, he managed to cope with it all. But now I think, you know, he's enjoyed his month off. 
and it's back to the real business that, that securing him his future, and that's boxing. And I think in the next few days, it's going to be a, a lot clearer to everybody actually where um, he's going. You know, obviously the kid Galahad fights there, and there's also talk of Oscar Valdez, but Oscar Valdez fights Carmine Tomasone in a WBO title defence next Saturday, February the 2nd, which we actually got on Box Nation. So in the next week or so, I think we'll get a clearer idea where Josh is going fight-wise, against who and where. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that will all become very clear. And one thing that I'll mention is I love that he's actually just talking about Valdez. And he's talking about Santa Cruz right now. This doesn't happen all the time where a fighter becomes world champion and immediately seeks out unification. Sometimes they want to, all right, well, I'll, you know, I'll fight my mandatory. I, I want a couple of fights. I want to, you know, settle into being a world champion. He's just straight up saying, all right, I want Valdez. Uh, I'd actually quite like Santa Cruz as well. And he's, he's, he said this when he took the Frampton fight as well. He said, what's the point in waiting? It may never happen. Happen. Look at what happened with Brook and Khan. And I really like that attitude. It's fantastic, his attitude. When every fighter wins a world title, they all say, I want to fight the best. I want to fight him next. But mm. in the in the background, they, uh, there's, there's plenty saying to their manager as well. Can we get a couple of volunteers for this to amass the fortune, my fortune? And I don't have a problem with that. But this mm. guy, he's serious. He's not in boxing long term. I think he's one of these guys who in a couple of years you know, might just vanish from the scene. You know, once he, if he sees there's a little decline, he'll go. He's got a little property portfolio. He's got a great life in Leeds and he just wants big fights. One of the benefits actually with, with the featherweight division is that the biggest fights are actually the best fights as well. So Santa Cruz, you know, he is one of the best and he is the like the biggest name. Valdez, he is one of the best. He is one of the biggest names. You know, Frampton was one of the best. He was one of the biggest names. It's not like, say, the heavyweight division where you've got, Maybe Luis Ortiz is one of the best, but he's not one of the biggest names, you know, and he's, it's not necessarily a big fight to take. It's different in the featherweight division. It, it's 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 good to see because all the big fights, I think they're going to happen. And you know what? If you look at all, all the world champions there, you know, Santa Cruz, Valdez, Josh Warrington and Gary Russell, if he can get active, mm. they could all fight each other and there'll be people making a case for both fighters. That's what makes these fight, these featherweight fights so good. There isn't, a, you know, you might just say, well, is Santa Cruz perhaps the best? But then you see Warrington's last two performances. Is he the best? Gary Russell, well, if he was more active, what a boxer he is. Would his speed be too much for any of them? And then Oscar Valdez, well, you know, top rank were giving him the, the big treatment. If he can get busy again and, and, and recovered from that broken jaw, will he be the best? You know, it's a fantastic division. Absolutely. And, and let's say 18 months time, you can throw Mick Conlon, you can throw Shakur Stevenson into the mix there as well. It's, it really is a glamour division and it's a great division to be talking about. Ricky Hatton trained heavyweight prospect Nathan Gorman moved to 15-0 in December last year with a win over former world title challenger Razvan Kajanu. Well, Gorman returns to action next month and is looking forward to a big 2019. Nathan, quick return to action after your 12-rounder against Razvan Kajanu. You looking forward to fighting in Leicester next month? Yeah, definitely. You know, it was uh, it's definitely a quick turnover. I only had, well, I had Christmas off, you know, I had some good time with my family and stuff. I had a good two weeks off. And I got back in the gym, you know, and they uh, offered me to fight in Leicester on the 23rd of February. I think we're just a little under now, five weeks to go. So it's good, you know, keeping busy, which is the main thing, you know, keeping active. And I'm going to push on now for a good 2019. What are you looking to get out <coughs> of boxing in 2019? Besides, you know, even more <coughs> experience and learning a lot more. Obviously, like you said, more experience and keep on learning. Winning, but I want to push on for 2009 for, you know, domestic tiles, European tiles. I want to push on now and... Uh, get my name up in them top five rankings, you know, in the governing bodies. That's, that's, that's my big aim for 2019 titles. Who is there in the British um, heavyweight division where it could be easy to match? We obviously, we've got Dubois. Is there anyone else <laughs> out there? Well, obviously, I do want the Dubois fight, you know. Um, you know, it's probably the two best prospects in Britain, if not the world. And we both got the same promoter. It makes a lot of sense. And I, I'd imagine, I think, Yui's given up the, the British title. That's going to come up vacant. So there's a potential, there's a potential fight there, and for the British title. I get the impression you might want it a bit more than that. Their, their, their camp do right now. Yeah, definitely. Which obviously it's understandable. You know, I've had five or six fights more than Daniel. Granted, but you know he's had the he's had the big stage from day one. You know, I haven't. He had his debut on a massive BT Sports show. You know, I didn't. 
so I've had to work for two of my spots. He's had since day one, so that's where he's had all the, the public and the hype behind him. You know, I had to gradually get mine. And um, he's fighting <laughs> Razvan Kajano, who you beat before Christmas yeah. at the Manchester Arena. What can he expect from Kajano? Kajano, you know, he's a very he's a very experienced operator. You know, he doesn't he doesn't look much on the outside, but when you're in there with him, he's very clever. He knows when to nick a rest. He knows how to how to wrap up a molly. He can spoil a fight. You know, he can take a shot as well. Um, little things, you know, little tricks. He, he'll he'll hit you low. He'll elbow you. He'll maul you. Pu push his weight. Use his size advantage because you know he's a big fella. He's 20, 21 stone probably in the ring. And you know, if someone's leaning on you for 10, 12 rounds plus, you know. It saps a lot of energy. Was he trying to wind you up a saw in there? Exactly. And he was talking. He was talking to me. You know, calling me little names on the inside. You know, if you if you got a, a bad temperament, if you lose your cool and you're walking to a to a big right hand from a twenty stone man, you know, it's not it's not gonna be good, is it? What, what was he calling you? Well, he was calling me all sorts. He was calling me a little bitch. You know, um, Hatton's bitch. He was calling me. He was calling me. <laughs> you name him. He was calling me. I thought me on. I thought, geez, you know, he was he was getting beneath my skin, but. That's what that's what he wanted to do, you know. He wanted me to to lose me cool, rush in there with big punches, and you know, just plant one right in my chin. Would, would you ever lose it? Would you ever answer him back, or did, would did you ever just would you see him red at all? Um, on the inside, quarter forty. I'd love to just knock, knock your teeth down your throat now, but you got to be calm in here in the boxing ring. You know, if you if you if you lose your rag, which from his point of view, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted me to lose my rag. So I could wing big shots and you know walk onto a big massive round or any punch really. It's clever. It was quite ironic at the final bell. I think he <laughs> ran, ran to Ricky for a cuddle before he embraced you. I think. Yeah, he was a big fan of Ricky. To be fair, you know, he was a really big fan. He was, he was telling he was telling me this um, afterwards because I went I was in the same changing room afterwards after the fight and he was telling me he was a big fan of Ricky. He fights Daniel Dubois. How yeah. do you see that fight going? It's a it's a two way street that fight, uh, Stephen. You know, I can see it rather Daniel knocking him out early. Or Razvan, you know, cuddle him and doing little tricks, you know, and he's going to get to round seven, round eight, and he's still doing them little uh, leaning on tricks, you know, little elbow, shoulder in the face. It'll test Daniel's art, but on the other hand, you know, Daniel could have the style perfect, perfectly for Razvan, you know, end up knocking him out. I hope he does, to be fair. I really do. Why? Then he'll probably think in his own mind, you know, if, if I've knocked Razvan out, I can knock Nathan out, and he'll probably get the, the cojones to fight me. You're actually going to personally be at the Royal Albert Hall in oh, I'll be there, ringside yeah. cheering yeah. on Daniel to knock someone out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. Um, against Kavana, did you learn more in that fight than any other? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I learned little things off him. You know, um, little things on the inside. Why he was very clever. Right? He knew when to go and rest. You know, and walk around and you know talk to you. You know, bide the time. You know, he'd done two or three episodes talking to the ref. But if you add it up over the, them 12 rounds, he's had 30 second rest per round. Very clever. And when you look at the, the world scene, the end of 2019, who will be standing as the world's number one heavyweight, in your opinion? Tyson Fury. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt in my mind. Tell us what's it like sparring with Tyson. He's, he's um, very, very, very good. You know, um, very, very elusive. You know, he's got something, a natural talent, you know, something, something that can't be taught. You, you wouldn't teach that style what Tyson's got, you know what I mean? He's hands up, hands down, switch hitter, you know, very elusive fire, comes forward, goes back. He's a nightmare to spar, you know, you can hardly hit the man. And, he, and he's very fit. You know, when he when he come back through this gym door, you know, I seen him come in and do 10, 12 rounds, breezed, breezed it, and he was 28 stone then. So what he can do now, you know, <laughs> I don't know. How long do you think before you're at that stage, world titles? Because um, at the moment, it seems pretty much for, I mean, although, you know, you'll fight for a world title tomorrow if the yeah. offer was right. You're, you're, course, you're a yeah. fighter, you're yeah. a natural yeah, fighting man. But it seems with the Joshua Wilder, Fury situation, all fighting, yeah. possible rematches, yeah. the elite seem tied up for 18 months, maybe two years. Yeah, exactly. Being realistic, you know, me age, I'm only 22 years of age. I want some good, you know, good learning fights, you know what I mean? Uh, like I said previously, domestic titles, European titles. But yeah, probably in the next two years, Stephen, I can see myself on the, the world the world stage, you know, that's where I want to be, ideally. You know, 24, 25, you know, I'll be pushing on for the world world stage, if not a world champion. You know, Manuel Char, he's a world champion at the minute, there's, there's a potential fight there. Love that, wouldn't you? I definitely would. <laughs> <laughs> and as you're going with Rick and all the lads in the gym, I know Rick's up away for another couple of days, but you've got Mike and Blaine looking after you while he's not here. Yeah. 
well it's good you know when rick goes away you know working or you know at the minute he's away you know on holiday which is a dial to you know he's, he's in here all the time with us we always have uh, mike and blaney you know 24 7 you know we're left in good hands you know they, they know the job they do they do wonders for us in here I don't think Rick expected you to be back in action so quick, did he? <laughs> no, I don't think, no, I don't think he did. <laughs> Which is a good thing, though. I like being busy. It's good. But with fights being 12 rounds now, you're not going to be having the six, seven fights a year. You, it is going to be three or oh, four. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's going to mimic down. The, my manager told me, Mick, you know, he said probably three fights, possibly four, you know, if we get a, if you, you know, do well. Which is obviously is understandable because if you're on six rounds, you can have five or six fights a year, can't you? But with 12s, because it's hard, and especially if you go the distance and you have a hard fight, you need a good three, three week recovery. Well, Steve, lots of sound bites there from Nathan Gorman. He's, he's really quite a talker, but one in particular I wanted to just pick your brains on. He said he'd love a crack at Manuel Char. Now, there was something ordered by the WBA, um, I believe, earlier on in the week. Can you talk me through it? <laughs> he said he'd love a quick crack, crack at Manuel Char. I'm not, I'm not surprised. If you lined up all the heavyweights who wanted a crack at Manuel Char, you would most probably be, you could put them on top of each other and you'd reach to Peking Tower. <laughs> that big that big skyscraper there. How mad is it what the WBA have done? They've ordered this series, shall we say, mm. um, this Super Four, we're going to call them. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. Jack, the, the, Jack, the guys involved must be amazing. Go on, who, who you got? Well, Gerald Miller, who's about 23 stone on a good day, um, is fighting Trevor Bryan in some sort of interim final eliminator. The winner goes into the showdown of all showdowns between the WBA regular champion, Manu Chua, and the Puerto Rican, Fresa Quendo, who hasn't boxed since God was a little boy. <laughs> and the winner of that becomes the mandatory for the WBA belt. It's madness. It's absolute madness. For a start, Gerald Miller's most probably going to fight Anthony Joshua in New York in June. So whether they'll find someone else for Trevor Bryan, I, I don't know. It's an absolute mad situation. And sometimes these governing bodies don't help themselves. If they wanted to just clean it up quick, just, you know, they put themselves in this position with Manuel Char. Obviously, he's, he's kept his title after this, you know, drugs controversy where after he appealed and kept, kept it on a technicality. Even though it'd be a horrible thing, just make him mandatory contender and get these regular titles out the way. Just get it done. Just get, get, get it done. Get, horrible get, as it would be, <laughs> Manuel Char fighting. It's the only way. You can't just say we, we're scrapping a regular title because they'll have lawsuits coming out there. There is. And it's a mm. crazy situation. And you would certainly put both Daniel Dubois and Nathan Gorman in against Charo Quendo. Frank Warren would make those matches in a heartbeat. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what, what I'd add there is, um, like, it, you know, before we were hearing things about Joshua fighting a wild card opponent potentially. It might not be X, it might not be Y, it may not be Z, it may be a wild card opponent. Imagine it! Imagine it! If it was Anthony Joshua against Fresa Quendo, what a wild card that would be. Announced for June, New York, forget Big Baby Miller, we're going to Quendo, we're going to remove him from boxing once and for all. How about that, Steve? Oh, mate, um, <laughs> it, 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 that's not going to happen, Dev. No. You're getting too excited Sorry, there. Mate. I don't know how this mess is going to end up with a WBA, because it looks like Jamel Miller for um, Big AJ in June. Well, on Gorman versus Dubois, he... he Gorman mentioned it there, and we, I think we can push all we like. Frank Warren ain't going to do that fight just yet. It's not going to be their next fight. But imagine it when Gorman's 20-0 and, and Dubois 15-0. and 0, That fight becomes a monster. It's a fantastic fight. I, I can't wait for it to happen. And what makes it so fantastic, not that they're both unbeaten and young British heavyweights, is that people are split down the middle. Who wins that fight? Nathan sort of touched on it then. I think he almost hopes that Kajanu gets chinned by Daniel Dubois, mm. because then people, you know, it takes the pressure off him. People were saying, oh, Daniel Dubois did this to Gajano. Nathan Gorman went the distance with him. It's, it's styles that make fights. But when that fight happens, I think it's going to be middle of next year before it happens. And what a blockbuster that will be. And this year, it's all about Nathan's doing his bit media-wise and introducing himself to the British public. He's good on interviews. Daniel is a, quite a shy guy. The media isn't the most important thing to him. If Daniel could sell himself that bit better, it would make this fight even more colossal. 
Well, I think Dubois got that kind of silent assassin thing about him. It's almost become his thing to not be brash, to not be talking a lot. He's just does his business in the ring. And then, then you've got you've got a real you've got two great protagonists there in Gorman who who would be mouthing off at the presser about Dubois and Dubois just being very almost Terminator like. So yeah. um, I, I think it's still a good story there. Oh, it's a good story, but you know, to do to keep that story going along those lines, Daniel's got to continue knocking people out this year. Yeah. You, yeah. you can't go and have three points wins this year and then go into it talking I'm the silent destructor. Well, Dubois is back on March the 8th at the Royal Albert Hall. He takes on Razvan Kajanu, who Nathan Gorman just beat on points. So it's one of those measuring stick fights because Joseph Parker also beat Kajanu on points. Luis Ortiz knocked him out. So can Dubois knock out Razvan Kajanu? What does that say about Daniel Dubois? Let's find out. March the 8th, Royal Albert Hall on BT Sport. December 22nd was a huge night for Josh Warrington, but it might just have been an even bigger night for Tommy Fury. Yes, the 19-year-old younger brother of Tyson made his professional debut live on that huge show on BT Sport box office. Here's how he felt on that night. Um, you know, it was it was it was a magical feeling um, because don't forget this day that was coming. I've dreamt about this day for many, many, many years as a child. Um, so when I woke up in the morning, it was a different, different feeling. So I knew that um, obviously tonight was going to be the biggest night of my life. It was for me to put on a show. I was on a good platform, you know, I was televised on BT Sport. Um, so it felt like all the pressure was on, but not to me because when I when I woke up, I just thought, you know what? You don't care what the last name is. I'm just going to go out there and be my, be myself. And I think that's what I'm trying to get across to everyone in the build-up as well. You know, their press conferences, interviews. I just want to get across the point that I'm my own man. Tyson's his own man. You know, if, if I was trying to get on the back of somebody, you know, I'd be, I'd be training over there in Spain. You know, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be stuck to him like glue. But I'm here in high, training with Ricky, playing and Mike, and doing my own thing. You know, I'm just trying to crock on, do the best that I can in this boxing game. When you woke up that, that morning, had your personality changed at all from, you know, we see this very mild mannered, yeah. very laid back person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what we see in front of a camera is the person you are oh, did, did you become moody or angry at all no no i had uh, i had all my friends there you know uh, i had a big speaker in my house and so that i was leaving to go to the venue i had all the big big tunes on and i was just taking everything in my stride went and had a coffee and just you know we had good support I had a good laugh with the friends and family and uh, that's what it's about because at the end of the day if you don't enjoy what you're doing you're never going to go to the pinnacle of your sport or you know a guy could be working in a warehouse could be working in an office if you don't like getting up in the morning, say for the office guy, he's not going to get the promotion. For the warehouse guy, he's not going to get to that manager spot. But in boxing, if you love what you're doing and you're constantly improving, you'll get to the very top. What was it like fighting someone who was just there to survive? <laughs> Do you know what? <laughs> the odd shot and when you, when, every, when you would catch him clean, yeah. would like hold on yeah. and grab another 10 seconds yeah, doing yeah. something else. Do you know what it was? He, at the end of the day, it's like me sitting there saying, oh yeah, this and this and that. You gotta give the man respect. It's in there. He's, he's he's doing the hardest job in the world. He's trying to earn a bit of money for his family, probably. So you know you gotta take your hat off to him. But it's a good learning curve for me because watching it back, you see you see the way you get held. You know in certain clinches when he's on the ropes, buying time. You know, and it's just it's it's what they're gonna come. You know, I'm gonna have all different styles and fellas in the ring. So it's just about adapting to them styles and uh, making the best of it on the night. But I, I believe I box well. You know, as I've been told off. You know, my trainers, friends, family. That box very well, so um, and for a guy with 12 amateur fights, it's uh, it's not very bad at all, I'd say. I mean, you got a quick return. Um, Frank yeah. Warren's next show, very next show, you're yeah. on in Leicester, February the 23rd. Yeah. What can we expect in that fight that we might not have seen in December at the arena? Um, a big, dirty knockout. That's what's coming on uh, February. Um, because, you know what, I'm just going to go in there and box and all I can because I know I've got power in my hands. I know I've got dynamite, dynamite punches, you know, my dad from being a seven, eight year old when he took me on the pads, he said, you can punch like a horse. So I know if I let them off, they let these cannons off, right? They ain't, they're only going one way and that's down. And I'm here to put a show on it. Like, I don't want to be treated like, oh, you know, he's only a baby, this and that, because there is no babies in this game. I'm a baby in a man's world. So I just want to go out there and show everyone what my skills are. And each fight by fight, I just want to show everyone that I'm going like this, you know, improving all the time. Why are you the punter in the Fury family? Because Tyson has got 
one's an amazing skill set. Yeah, yeah. Huey the same. Yeah. And your dad, yeah. uh, big man, but he, yeah. was a, he wasn't a knockout artist, big no, John. He no. must probably come and sort yeah, me yeah. out for saying that. So why, why, are you the, why are you the banger in the family? And I apologise for big John there. Do you know what? You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, I'm a banger banger. Because like a banger banger for me was, you know, someone like Mike Tyson. I feel like I've got heavy hands. Like I'm not, but I'm not all about that. Like I, I've got, I've got a lot of skill myself. I can go on the bank foot. I can go forward. That's what we're working on now in training. But I just, I don't want to be a one trick pony. I want to, I want to have everything. So then when I get in these tougher fights, I'm not relying on one thing. It's like, right, I'm saying, if I've got an opponent here, right, it's tough. He ain't gonna bomb him out. No worries. Box circles around him. Jab his head off all night. No problem. Right, this guy here don't really like the body. Body shots. No problem. And in this game, it's it's all about progression. So I don't care if I'm progressing half a percent, a percent at a time. As long as I'm seeing them improvements, I'm a trainer and my team's seeing them improvements. I don't care. I can go as slow as you want because I'll tell anybody this. I'm in no rush at all. I'm 19 years old. Where is the rush? I've had 12 amateur fights and people's. I, Comments mean nothing to me. A passive comment is absolutely nothing. But it just makes you laugh because you see him on the Instagram when you upload a picture or whatever. The comments are saying, oh, chuck him in with someone that can actually fight. You know, someone commented, oh, put him in with a top, top 10 contender then. And someone said, yeah, yeah, why not? I don't know what they're expecting. You know, it's I've had no fights. I'm a young kid, just let him learn. So I'm going to take my time. I'm going to get the right fights at the right time and um, see where I end up. All I'm doing is the best that I can. And I understand talking to one of your trainers, Mike Jackson, he yeah. said you come back after the Christmas break. Yep. They weighed everybody the first day and yep. you was a pound heavier than your fight. Yep, I weighed in at 12.12 and I come back in the gym at 12.13. So what did you do over Christmas? Just train? Do you know what? I wish I wish I could sit here and say to you, I said, I didn't train. I ate pizzas, kebabs, whatever you want, but it's called, it's called constant professional, let's call it that, eh? <laughs> but I don't know, I've got the uh, fast metabolism, but I'm fit now and I'm ready to go. I think it's four four weeks to go. Yeah, four weeks to go, something like that. And I just can't wait to get back out there. You know, if it was up to me, I'd be fighting every month. You know, and the shows and the breaks that I'm getting, I'm just uh, very thankful um, that they're putting me on and you know, dedicating the time into me. And uh, I, won't, I won't let everyone down. I'll get there slowly but surely. And also the attention's coming back on your big brother Tyson yeah. now. Um, have you seen him since Christmas or trained him at all? Nope. No, he's uh, he's been doing his own thing, and like I say, I've been doing mine. Uh, but. I'm sure 2019 will be a massive year for him. You know, he's got some really good fights there if they can get made. But um, I just I just want, you know, the the main two fighters in the division to just come up because I've seen all these, you've seen a lot of talk over the internet, what have you. If a man's getting offered over 50 million to fight, over 40 million to fight, there ain't, it's nothing to do with boxing. It's about what's in here. Because I'm not being funny. If you ask, I'd fight anyone, I'd fight anyone for 10 million, let alone 80 million. So let's get it on. How much money do you want? You know what I'm saying? You've just got to get in there. It's a boxing match at the end of the day. You win, you win, you lose, you lose. Because you can't look. You got. He's got both of them. They got to get the tail between the legs and say, "Come on, let's fight." Because Tyson, he's been to America. He's been to Germany against the two. You know, Klitschko and Wilder. And Wilder can knock this full building down in the space of ten seconds. So they just need to grow up, get a pair of balls, and come and fight at the end of the day. Because the fights have been there to make. So let's please the public. That's what it's about. It's about the fans, and the fans want these fights. So enough about money and all that sort of stuff. Just get the fights on because it's about fans at the end of the day and that's what we want to see. And boxing's always in a better place if the heavyweight division is healthy. So if we can get Tyson against AJ yeah. after he fights Wilder again. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. business, it's great for the industry. That's what I'm saying. You know, heavyweight boxing is nothing like it because everyone loves a good knockout. The paying public come to see knockouts, whatever like that. And you know you're going to get it with these heavyweights. So if the two, if, if the three best in the world can get it on this year it'll be a good year won't it for the sport because at the end of the day it's all about getting the right fights at the right time and 2019 is the year for these fights sam maxwell is 10 and 0 as a pro the super lightweight who twice shared the ring with vasil lomachenko believes 2019 will be a breakthrough year for him here's super sam with super steve lillis Sam, so you've had 10 fights, you've breezed through them, and now we're going to have a step up in Leicester where you make your BT debut. Yeah, um, I think I've gradually progressed through all my fights. Opponents have, get, have had all different kinds of opponents, um, but I'm ready for the step up now and um, really test myself and uh, really challenge myself, and I'm um, looking forward to it on the um, 23rd of Feb. What's it been like for you when you've been appearing at uh, midnight? 
it's, it's hard getting ready at five o'clock in the afternoon and it, or in the evening and then waiting for seven hours ready to go at any minute uh, it's hard but you know it's it's, it's experience in a bank and um, i'm used to that now so I've, I've earned my place on tv and in a good slot so yeah putting the the graph and um, when you was at Manchester, when Carl Frampton fought challenged Josh Warrington in that great fight, and you were in the changing rooms, what did you see or what could you hear? Because you was the, you was next in. Yeah. Um, so I got told that okay, Sam, you're going to be on um, if this goes early as well. Uh, so I go in first round. It just goes off. Warrington catches Frampton a few times, wobbles him. I just ran ran back to the changes, thinking I'm on. Definitely this fight might not go the distance. It looks like it looks like they're going for it, which they were, and uh, then it went. 12 rounds and great fight. Missed one of the best fights of the year. Sat in the back, ready to ready to box. It was uh, frustrating, but you know it's part of part of it. Could you hear all the noise outside? Hear all the cheer, all the fans, or like it, the atmosphere was unreal. Like best atmosphere I've ever seen, and um, could hear it all. Yeah, could feel the buzz. I couldn't wait. Thinking I'd, I, this is what I'd love to get on just just after this. And uh, yeah, wasn't wasn't to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, in your division, you know, you're one of the emerging stars of it. There's a lot of fighters. There. There's a lot of talk going on about you fighting O'Hara Davis later this year. How do you see that fight and what do you think of O'Hara? It's, it's a fight, definitely, I'd, I'm looking forward to, I'd look forward to being, being in it to be a massive test. It's obviously a step up for me, but because um, I rate, rate O'Hara highly. I think he's got great power. He's obviously boxed at the top level, so he's, he's got that experience. And uh, he's, he's a very awkward um, operator, but you know, it's a fight I, I'm, I'm excited for and it's one I know I can win and um, yeah, hopefully I get, I get my chance at him um, by the end of the year, definitely. Can you, can you knock him out? I think I could, yeah. I think uh, he's been, uh, he's been stopped off Josh Taylor. Oh, Catterall, yeah, him and Catterall was more of a fencing match, like um, they did not, neither of them really landed um, any telling shots, but I think, I think I would land on him and uh, I'd, I'd get to him with my, with my speed and my feet work. I think I'd, I'd, uh, I'd get to him and I could knock him out, definitely. What do you make of the persona for him from what you see? He's, he's done well. He's, he's done, he's, he, it's, it's, that's, what, that's what it is. It's a persona. It's his boxing persona, and he's, um, it's, it's, it's done well for him. It's, it's got him, got him a great career. Got him some big fights, and um, but it's also got him a lot of people that hate him, especially from Liverpool, Liverpool box, um, fans and people who follow boxing hate him. Like so, it would be massive for me. I know if I fought him, I'd have all of Liverpool behind me anyway. Even though I'm not, even though I'm from here, if I wasn't, they'd be behind whoever's against O'Hara, and it'll just give me that extra extra lift because he, he's beat he's beat two people I know he's beat Derry and he's beat Tom Farrell two scousers so I'd want to get revenge for them uh, over him and I think uh, I think I could you're closing on your first your first you know major with a professional title there's some great fights for you besides O'Hara I mean Terry Fanagan what, what's your opinion of Terry I know you sparred together yeah I rate Terry highly I think he's, he's, a, he's a great boxer and um, very fit um, works hard and he's boxed at the top level and he, he's only lost to two um, people who are world champions is Progra, which is world champion, yeah, two world champions. So he's he's at, he's at that elite level. Um, definitely a fight I, I'd be interested in in, in the future as well. Um, had some great rounds sparring with him. Gave me a lot of good advice. He's, he's just an all-round good guy. He is and you know I, I hope he he gets a, a top fight again in the future and hopefully I get to fight him in the future as well. And another possible opponent. Um, I think he's going to go for a world title first. He's the mandatory for the WBO crown. Is Jack Cattrall? Yeah, another massive name. Um, He's, he holds a win over one of my teammates, Tyrone McKenna, in, in a close fight. So, um, you know, I don't think he's out of range. If, if he obviously he's going for this world title shot in the next um, year or so, but you know, I want to be next in line when I work work up, so that I'm next in line for him then, and um, hopefully get the chance at these big names. How'd you on with Jack? Because he was in Tyrone's corner when you was always. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what did you say? Did you sort of just hello and walk away, or did you have a chat? Yeah. Um, he was supposed to be walking Tyrone out. That, that's what he agreed to, and that. But then he ended up having to do the spit bucket and all that. Yeah. He, he was laughing. He was laughing as well. But um, yeah, I didn't speak to him. He's quite quiet, Jackie. Mm -hmm. I haven't spoken much to him. Like he's, he's just a quiet lad. He just smiles and laughs and that says hello. But um, I haven't spoken much to him. Seems seems an alright lad though. Yeah, but you both fight each other. That's yeah. it. What do you think of Maurice Hooker, the WBO champion? Yeah, I think he's 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 good at what he does. He's a, he's a long range boxer. He's got good um, uh, jab and backhand. And um, yeah, I like his style. But um, I don't think he's the Top like welterweight, I think uh, Josh Taylor is, is the top one. Then you've got uh, Progra, and it is Mikey Garcia, like well welterweight light, as well. He's, yeah. light, he, he's jumping the world, he's, he's, he's just a he's lightweight, level. he yeah. goes light well, he goes where he wants. That's it. So I think um, Hook is one I could, um, I would rather take my shot out of them for not, not underestimating him or giving him any disrespect, but um, not the best out of the light welters, I don't think. 
at some stage, Vasil Lomachenko will go to like world <laughs> or, or, or junior world or whatever you have to call it these days. You went 10 rounds and win two amateur fights. Um, would you like to fight him again? I'd like, I'd like to fight him again just, just, just to say I've been with him as a pro, but uh, no, nah, just say he's, he's, he's an elite, elite, he levels above um, anyone and um, just incredible. I'm, I'm proud that I get to say I've done 10 rounds with him. Um, but also, I got paid like £400 for that, fighting him. I'd get, I'd get 10 times that now, wouldn't I? Or, or 100 times that. So. 100 times that. <laughs> times that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's doing, he's doing really well. And um, oh, I'd, I'd be, you know, I might start calling him out. What, four, uh, <laughs> nah. four, 400 quid each time or 200 quid each time? 400 quid each time. So you've got 800 pounds yeah. for going 10 rounds. 10 rounds of Lomachenko, Lomachenko, exactly. Um, that was like four fights before he boxed Salido as well. <laughs> 800 quid. And when you fought him in the Ukraine, you weren't supposed to fight him. You just saw this bloke getting changed at the weigh-in, didn't you? Yeah, so I was watching a boxing lad called Rudenko, watched videos on him, prepared this. He's someone I'm going to beat him levels above. And um, I'm sat, ready to get weighed in with my water. See Lomachenko come in and um, we, look, we all looked at him. We saw, and uh, I was like, oh, I wonder what he's doing there. He must be here for the, for the press conference or something. And the lads were laughing. They say, nah, Sam, you're going to be fighting him. I went, no chance. Like, he just walked in today. There's no chance. Their general manager comes over. Uh, Rudenko's, he's ill today. We've, we've gone to Lomachenko's house. He said he'll take the fight. And he, he, so you're fighting him now. I was like, no, he gets on the scales ripped to death like he'd been training for 12 weeks. I was like, he found out today, no chance. But uh, it was a great experience in Kiev. Um, Really good experience out there, and I'm glad I took it, and I'm glad I got to fight him again in uh, in London a few weeks later. That was a great night, that in London. Wasn't yeah, it? we got to see Lomachenko and Usic uh, box Joe Joyce, and it was, it was a great night. So, where, where do you think you, um, this year, 29? What does it hold for you this year? Um, I think it's going to be my breakthrough year, where I, like I said, February 23rd, I'm going to get a shot at um, get my name out there, get maybe get a title, and um, progress from there. Big fight, February 23rd. Get through that, and then just. You know, it's it's my it's my time, it's my chance. You have got a bit of time on your side, so you you happy to wait? If it takes eighteen months to get the world title fight, whichever route MTK and Frank decide to go for you, definitely. I think um, you know I feel good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling young. I'm excited in my training um, with Danny Vaughan in Scotland. I feel rejuvenated, and um, yeah, eighteen months I'll still be still be peaking. So definitely don't mind waiting. I mean, I know you're you're you've been speaking to you before Christmas, you were ready to go a few months ago, but you've only had 10 professional fights. Yeah. I think people have got, despite your vast amateur experience, people have got to take that into account, haven't they? Definitely, and, and, and the level of opponents I've had as a pro, um, it, if I start calling out these names and rushing, like I might be able to take a big fight with a name, uh, an elite level fighter straight away, and um, but I might not be at my best jumping f from such a step up, so it's good to, to get these step ups that I've had and build up, and hopefully that's my next fight as well. That's my um, step up again, and then I'm moving on to to elite level. Take my time, be patient, and you know Frank Warren's been doing this for I don't know how long, and MTK have got great experience, so they know how to build a fighter, and um, you know I think I'm on the right path and the right the right pace. Steve, if there's one fight I want to see this year for Sam Maxwell. I want to see him fight a horror day in this. What says you? Oh, it's one of the fights you want to see this year. Sam's absolutely begging for it. He's begging for breakout fights, and he'll get it this year. I mean, Sam's no spring chicken at 30, that long amateur career. So, you know, all the WSB experience going 10 rounds with Lomachenko. So, he can go now after 10 fights. And that is the fight that he wants. There's a lot of ingredients to the fight. Sam's really talking about it. O'Hara's got his, rep his reputation. And in Liverpool, O'Hara Davis is detested. So it's almost as if there's Sam Maxwell at the front with the whole of Liverpool behind him, whether they're Everton fans and Liverpool who want to see that fight. That, that is a bigger fight than you think for later this year. Yeah, I, I, I think so as well. And I... Yeah, you know, Sam Maxwell's been saying a lot. He's mentioned O'Hara Davis a few times and on social media it's it's come out. But O'Hara Davis at this point has not yet taken the bait. So Steve Lillis, little project for you. You've got to interview O'Hara Davis and you've got to ask him about Sam Maxwell. And we've got to find out what he thinks. We've got we gotta get him to got to get him talking, haven't we? Well, after I leave your side here, Dev, in our little six by six studio. The message is going in to O'Hara's WhatsApp to come on the podcast next week. Yes, that's what we want. We want OD on the boxing podcast. We want him next week. If you're listening to O'Hara, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he's amongst the millions. So if you are listening to O'Hara, we want you. And that's, um, you know, as I'm saying that, I'm pointy as well. So yeah, next week, we'll see you. Yeah. Now, Steve, you are Mr. Box Nation. If we were to cut you in half, it would be red and it would be blue. Talk me through what's coming up on Box Nation. 
Yeah, Dev, um, cameras are in Karlsruhe, Germany this weekend when Vincent Feginbutz, one of Sauland events, big prospects at super middleweight, yes. fights a pole called Prezemslaw Opalak. Um, big Vince, 26 KOs in 29 wins and Opalak the pole, 22 KOs in 27 wins. And it's must win for Vincent and um, a, a big risk fight because he's lined up for um, a WBO final eliminator next month mm. against another German, Shifat Isafai, for that title held by Gilberto Ramirez. So he's taken a risk taking on Opalak four weeks before a world title eliminated. And there's four fights on the bill and we're on, a, on air from eight o'clock. And um, it's a great warm up before the monster card next Saturday in Frisco, Texas, when there's three world titles. Oscar Valdez defending his WBO featherweight title against Carmine Tomasoni, an Italian. The IBF lightweight title fight is vacant between Richard Comey and Issa Shaniev and the WBO light heavyweight title rematch between Eliada Alvarez and Sergei Kovalev. Teofimo Lopez also on that bill next Saturday, February 2nd. But to warm up for that is Big Vince in Germany this Saturday night. And Steve, just, just on that, so Vincent Feigenberts, he's, he's fighting that pole. Is the prediction that he's going to pole axe the pole? Hey, they'll be hoping he's going to pole lax the pole. So it's going to be the prediction when he's got such a big fight next month. I mean, if he beats Isifu, Isu fight next month, he fights um, Gilberto Ramirez for the oh. WBO title. And if you remember when he turned pro, um, Fegan Boots, there was a lot of expectation around him. You know, he's had 29 wins, two losses. So, you know, he, he's got to do it now. I know he's young enough. He's got to do it now. He won that interim WBA belt, it seems like, an eternity ago yeah. against De Carolis. And then I think he lost it when they fought for the regular title in the rematch. So he's got to get on with it. And German boxing seems to be crying for a new start, isn't it? Well, it could be Big Vince himself. I look forward to finding out this Saturday night, Steve. Well, Steve, it's time for my favourite part of the show. There you go, I said it. It is my favourite part. I've got to ask you, what are you talking about, Lillis? I'm talking about bleeding boxers. And don't confuse me saying bleeding with my London accent there. It's how we talk in Battersea. <laughs> Battered Jack last weekend against Marcus Brown. One of the worst cuts I've ever seen. Was it five, six inches long? A hundred stitches needed. And people lavishing Jack with praise for his bravery and yeah and rightly so but there is no way he should have been allowed to finish the fight with an injury that bad that was shocking from the referee tony weeks and then the nevada commission for not getting involved that was horrendous that cut dangerous when, when that cut started really getting bad around seven eight rounds was it seven rounds he'd lost virtually every round he wasn't yeah. in the fight there's no way that should be allowed to continue. And that's a black mark on Tony Weeks. You know, it sounds not nice to say. It. It's almost as if Tony's thinking of the images of him with Clara all over his blue shirt afterwards. You, yeah, that, should not, that should not have been allowed to continue. <laughs> That's what happens. When when these cuts happen, there's two things you are guaranteed that will happen on the internet after these fights. There will be a picture of the man with the cut with the caption, you don't play boxing. And then there'll be a photo going viral of the referee with blood on his shirt, smiling, posing at the camera. This fight had that. It's happening all the time. You don't play boxing. We get it. We're not trying to play boxing. Yeah. Stop just using that caption. They're overusing it, Steve. Yeah, there's times you can use it, like a lot of things in yeah, boxing, but don't play boxing, for me, is up there with all of the marbles and strap season. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. We know you don't play boxing. We don't need every single person on social media to use that caption as if they invented it. You've got a double rent for the price of one this week there. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Lillis. It's a good rant. I'm looking forward to your one next week. Brilliant as always. Well, Steve, another week, another barn burner of a show. We've had Josh Warrington. It's an exclusive. Listen to it quickly, everyone, because we don't know what's going to happen with his whole situation and who he's going to fight next. Tell me, Steve, any hints as to who you've got lined up for us next week? Well, we're going to have a big go for O'Hara Davis. Yeah. I also want to get on the show one of our stars at the Royal Albert Hall, Johnny Garton. And I think, you know, John's got a nice story to tell because... When he, when he turned professional, he only wanted to fight for the Southern Area title. He's now one of the big attractions at the Royal Albert Hall. And then I'm sure you're going to get into my shell and say, Lilith, 
get this guy for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you right now. Him. I'll tell you right now, so it's not a surprise. I want Carl Frampton as well. How about it? We're on it. We're on it. <laughs> you, you tell me you want Carl Frampton. I am going out there to get him, and I won't be back until I do. So if My I miss man. it next week, you've sacked me. <laughs> <laughs> My man, that will never happen. Remember to tweet us any comments at Steve Lillis, at Sony Dev, and at The Boxing Pod, and leave us a review on iTunes. Both Steve and I are actually allergic to anything other than five stars, so please do respect our allergy. We'll see you next week. <laughs>